Howdy Leadership Scholars and welcome back to Alex 618. As we continue on our journey together, remember we are still in the module talking about forming, so that first stage of team development. So as we look at those different components of what makes a team successful, we need to talk about team norms and team culture and the impact that that has, not only recognizing, but developing and talking about, and even sometimes modifying that in order to fit the goals of the team or in order to help you succeed in whatever um, the organization wants you to do as a team. So that's our focus today. As we continue on and you're looking towards your final project too, I want you to think about what are these norms that you really want to establish within your working teams? How can you do that? How can you get others to help you do those things? What kind of culture do you work well in? You know, that's just a good thing to know when you're on the job market, right? Is this place going to fit me as well as I'm, am I going to fit it? And culture has an, a big impact on those things. So let's just get some fun definitions out of the way, right? What are team norms? So they are the acceptable standards of behavior that are shared by team members. You know, it's kind of funny. It's really just what we do, right? It just becomes normal. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about A&M as we go through this because, boy, if we have anything, we've got some organizational culture, right? Um, but there's a lot of things that we do that are just normalized that if you walk into Texas A&M, you think, these people are nuts, right? And so, that, it, but it's our norm. It's just what we do. And sometimes those are developed explicitly. So we talk about them, we decide on them, we make it a, here at A&M, a tradition, right? If you do it twice, it becomes a tradition. It's something that's actually thought about and brought in together for group discussion. And sometimes it's implicit. Sometimes it just happens. And no one can really quantify when it did or when it shifted. It just stuck and now it's just the way we always do things. So those norms are the ground rules that define appropriate and inappropriate behavior within a group. And we're going to talk about, we're going to break this down even more, but we're going to talk about what does behavior include. Man, that could include when do you get to work? When do you leave work? How long do you take for lunch? Um, where you decide to have your team meetings. There's so many things that go into norms. It's super multifaceted. Um, I found this picture and I thought, I don't know how that's a team norm for anybody. Um, but you know what? Maybe you are a team of crazy skydivers and this is what you do. You all join together in a certain pattern and that's your normal behavior. Um, again, and from the outside looking in, it seems a bit crazy, but you know, who are we to judge? Now, four main functions of the team norms. What do they do? How do they help us? The first thing they do is they help us express the team's central values, which is who are we? What do we value? Because we know that values-based leadership is absolutely not just a fad. It's a thing that's going to stay, I think, for quite some time, especially with our newer generations really being more transparent about talking about the impact of their personal values on work relationships. So we need to talk through that. As a team, what do we value? Do we value everyone's voice being heard within meetings? Or do we value getting in and out of a meeting in a timely fashion, right? Um, do we value having a conversation of, do we even need to have a meeting? I love that. Have you seen those t-shirts and coffee mugs like that say this meeting could have been an email? I love that, right? If that's one of your team norms, then you know that you don't want to waste each other's time. So talking about what you value, who we are as a group, and how that defines us is part of that norm. The second function of a team norm is establishing a common ground. So what this does is that it puts all the cards on the table, but it makes behavior more predictable. So when we're talking about these common rules, these common ground, we all know, hey, let's have a decision. We're all going to be at the meeting at this time. And maybe even to talk about that task and relationship orientation that we started talking about with team success, 
maybe in order to fulfill both of those roles within your team development, you set aside the first five minutes of your team meeting just to catch up on life. Hey, you know, who's dating who? Um, have you gone to the new restaurant in town? How's your mom doing? Show me the latest picture of your kids. Whatever that looks like, um, that way you have that, that common ground, that common vernacular, we're gonna do this, and we know after five minutes, done, move into task. And that way there's no bleed through. So it makes that understandable. If you're, um, if you're constantly late to meetings, what are you gonna do, right? As a team, if we have common ground of, we need to respect each other's time, therefore, if we call a meeting for 9.30 a.m., you honey better be in the seat at 9.30 a.m., not 9.45. Well then, if that goes sideways, then how do we actually correct that behavior? It helps um, define appropriate behavior for team members. So not only lateness, um, but it really helps people avoid embarrassing or difficult situations. Um, you know, I think one of the scariest times when you enter a new team is just trying to figure out, again, those norms, especially if you are a new member, that new jigsaw puzzle piece to a already established team. You've got to say, all right, what's actually going on here? And those norms let people know what to wear. They let people know, um, you know, is someone expected to bring donuts in the morning? And if you don't know that behavior, if you don't understand that norm, then it can be really embarrassing. Um, so that helps us, those norms help us clarify that. And it creates a team identity. What makes us unique? And we talked about this when we talked about team success, that most of us want to be a part of something that's just bigger than ourselves. And so norms help us create that team identity. It gives us a sense of comfort, a sense of community. If you're into you know, my sense of tribe, whatever that looks like for you, you've got your people and your people can help you move towards success personally and professionally in the team. So how do these team developments, uh, team norms develop? First of all, sometimes it happens out of crisis. <laughs> so when a critical event happens, when a crisis happens, how do we respond to that crisis? You've probably were in a team, whether that was a classroom or a um, maybe a work team, depending on what stage in life you were on when COVID hit, right? That was a crisis, y'all. And so when things shut down in March, you may not have come back to school, or you may not have gone back to work, or you may have had to figure out if you're working retail or you're working um, in a restaurant or, or something like that on, on a team there. How do we manufacture this new, I hate that idea of new normal, but how do we, how do we deal with this crisis? And based on those new rules, we developed some norms. We developed team norms that have absolutely changed. When I think about when I started, te well, shoot, when I took my first Teams class back in 2001, maybe? Yeah, maybe 2000, 2001, as an undergrad, we didn't talk about virtual Teams. Y'all, that wasn't a thing. Um, and now we can't talk about teams without talking about how do we deal with virtual teams. It's not just international anymore. Your virtual team could be your next door neighbor or the person in the office three doors down, but we're meeting virtually. And so that changed how we meet. It changed when we meet. It changed what is acceptable um, attire for team meetings, right? And during COVID, how many of you guys dress professionally from the uh, waist up? <laughs> and then after that, you're in house slippers, right? So it's that idea of critical events have a huge impact on developing what we consider normal behavior. Primacy, and especially if we're thinking about leading teams or developing a team of our own, it's the first thing that happens. So that first behavior that occurs in a team, it sets the precedence, right? It is the, hey, this is how we're gonna do things. Um, if you are a member coming in and you think, oh, well, okay, 
that's how it's done. Um, and no one really questions that because think about it. You're in that forming stage where you don't know people. It's awkward. You're not going to be the guy that goes, why do we do this? Right? It's just because we do. So primacy has a big impact. Most of the time, our norms actually happen unconsciously. So it's just gradual. Through mutual influence, when we think about learning and learning from a social science perspective, it's social learning theory, right? We grab on to those things that we see in others that we find credible. And we think that that is something we need to perpetuate. We are the sum of the six people closest to us. And so this mutual influence, even on words, um, I had an office mate one time that, oh man, she cussed like a sailor. And I really had to watch myself after being in a team meeting with her when I would go out that these words would just slip out because it was just normalized behavior for this team. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to be that person. So it's really interesting how our subconscious um, creates these norms for us. And then sometimes there's outside influencers. And we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of organizational culture on team culture um, because there is a, you know, it's a chicken and the egg type situation, but it's also, there is an influencing factor back and forth. So sometimes there are some societal influencers um, when we had to mask up, right? That was a, a team norm. Um, maybe your team was like, nope, I'm done with this. I'm going to take my mask off. Okay, um, that's your team norm. We're not going to sit six feet apart, uh, whatever that looked like, right? So cultural issues, um, we're going to talk a little bit about culture too and not just international culture. Um, again, because I teach a whole class on organizational culture, this is really hard for me to not launch into a bunch of things. But I think for most of us, um, culture is felt at home. So we have so many different subcultures in our own personal lives that actually dictate the rightness and the wrongness of actions. Um, so if you think about you're a student, right? You may also be a parent. You may also be a spouse. You may also be the oldest child. You may also be working 40 hours a week. You may be working 20 hours a week. All of those different cultures combine and they make us who we are. And it's really those subcultures that impact team norms just as much as anything else. So when we talk about this idea of development and perpetuation of team norms and culture, one of my favorite examples is the monkey banana experiment that they did. So if you don't know um, about this experiment, let me show you. So a group of scientists put together five monkeys in a cage um, obviously not these cute cartoon monkeys, but they put some stairs and a bunch of bananas up. So the monkey would climb the stair and when he would grab the monkey, the banana and eat it, then they would dump water on the four remaining monkeys. And so they kept doing this over and over. The monkeys kept trying to get the bananas, right? Cause they're hungry monkeys. That's just what they do. And so as they continue the experiment to where all the monkeys had the opportunity to climb the, the stairs, and they did, and all of them grabbed the banana. They started learning, right? Wait a minute. So here it says, by the time that they all figured it out, they would actually start beating each other up if somebody went for the banana. They're like, no, you can't do that. So the monkeys did not go for the bananas anymore. But then they put this new monkey in. See our blue monkey there? And guess what happened? Oh boy, those old monkeys grabbed that blue monkey and they said, no way, we're not gonna do this. So then they introduced another monkey. They took out an old monkey, put in a new monkey, and they continued the process. And y'all, guess what? When we got to the point where all of the old monkeys were already out of the cage and it was just all brand new monkeys, that behavior still continued. They kept going after each other. And it's because group socialization occurs that when you enter a team, when those norms are established, that is going to be perpetuated. So when you are developing 
your team culture, you have got to know that unless something crazy happens, this is going to probably outlive you on the team. So learn from the monkeys, right? Be very cognizant of what your team norms are. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of team norms. There's some positive impacts, right? There does some really good things. There's usually fairer and more clear communication, especially if that's established as a norm. Um, once people have those conversations, then they say, oh, okay, I understand why this is happening, but let's ask the question why. It helps maintain respect among all team members, which is very important. It also can help distribute power to weaker members. I, and I hate that that's what the literature uses, weaker members. Um, it could be quieter members. Maybe they're not weak, maybe they're introverts. Um, and if you've ever been in a team with multiple extroverts and a couple of introverts, you know that those extroverts will absolutely bulldoze those introverts. And if the introvert ever gets the gumption to actually be like, no, like I think this, everyone usually stops and listens because holy moly, they're actually talking. But so many times, and I will raise my hand and be the first one to admit, there are some of us in a team that we just like to hear ourselves talk. And so that becomes very problematic. <laughs> Talking about internal workings, um, it helps us figure those out. It helps us be clearer on those. It helps us to process in a more reliable way. There are some negative things. So one of the negative aspects of team norms is it enforces conformity. We become the monkey banana people, right? And we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. Whether or not it's a good idea, it can also dictate performance. When we talk about group member roles in the next lecture, um, if that is your role and you that's all you do, and it is a norm that you don't step outside of your group member role, um, then it absolutely can be detrimental in case there's a problem and you need to step in and do something different for someone. So again, just like life, right? Positive and negatives. But one of the things that I think is really interesting when it comes to, to team norms, and you've probably experienced this, is when a team starts to have problems. So when we start moving from storming to nor or forming to storming, it's really apparent that the problem is a lot of the time everyone sees the norm differently. Does that make sense? Like I'm working under the assumption of one norm. Somebody else is working under the assumption of another norm. But if we have not had the conversation of saying, these are our team norms, this is what we want our team to be. These are our values and our beliefs, then man, that's when conflict happens. So how do you formalize those norms besides just going through and talking, right? Which is also important. Oh, okay, let's start over there. <laughs> Don't you love it? PowerPoint animations. Okay, meeting times. So meeting times is when should meetings occur? All right, how often should the meetings be? How long? should team meetings be? I think that's really interesting. Um, when you think about how many pointless meetings you've had to sit through, but if you actually talk through this as a team and you come up with almost a team contract, these are our expectations. We will meet once a week for 30 minutes unless it's necessary for a second meeting or it's necessary for a, a meeting to be longer, whatever that looks like. Who is responsible, the next one, agenda and meetings and minutes. Who's responsible for setting up the meetings? Who's responsible for having agenda ready? Who's in charge of taking minutes? Now it's interesting with group member roles, sometimes you have somebody who's a natural recorder. They're good at it, they like writing things down, they have an ear for it, um, and they may volunteer to be that person. When it comes to agendas, I would encourage you to think through, if it is shared leadership within your team, share the responsibility of developing the agenda. So if you are working on a specific part of that project, have the person that is leading that part of the project create the agenda. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Now, if you're in a team that has a designated leader or a designated liaison, someone just to be the facilitator of the group process, then that would be that person's job. <laughs> Promptness. 
I love that this is like in the literature. People are like, we hate people that are late. I love it. So, but promptness is very important. Um, growing up, the daughter of an ag teacher, I was always taught if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're left. And I, I'm pretty sure my dad left quite a few uh, high school kids at the ag barn. Um, but it's that in me, being on time is hugely important. I had a friend all through college that Jan didn't know what time it was, and it really didn't matter to her. And that used to drive us crazy. When we had to home alone through the airport, we were going to New Orleans, we had to home alone it through the airport because Jan just couldn't get herself ready in time, right? And that was that was the last straw for me. So what I learned was that we had to tell Jana that the meeting started 30 minutes before it actually did because we were in the same sorority. And when we did that, Jan was on time. And it took her a while to realize that she had a different start time than the rest of us. Um, but we wanted, that was one of our norms. We liked promptness. Conversational courtesies. So how should the team encourage members to not only talk in a respectful manner toward each other, but listen, really listen first, speak later. And should the team have rules to limit interruptions or rules for monopolizers? So when you have that group of extroverts, or if you have that person that just seems to be the idea, idea generator, even if the ideas are bad, they wanna let, sure, let you know what their ideas are. And enforcement, this is really important. How do we enforce our norms? I love, if you are a, well, when working with students, I would have them develop a team contract where they actually talked about, if this person does this, this, this more than three times, they're out and they kick them off their team. If you have that power, utilize that power. There's nothing worse than having that social loafer. Okay, let's go back to the beginning, right? Ha, huh, decisions. How should the decisions be made within the team? We're gonna talk about decision-making when we talk about storming, because that usually creates some kind of conflict, um, are you going to go for consensus? Are you going to go for democracy? Are you going to say that the person that's leading that specific part of the project actually has a bigger impact on the decision-making process than maybe your teammate that has no idea what's going on? Attendance. So this is actually talking about legitimate reasons for missing meetings. <laughs> right? Um, at Texas A&M, is it a university excused absence? And we know that that is, oh boy, that doesn't cover nearly as much as it should if you've had to delve into that. Like if you have a family member pass, if they're in your immediate family, then it is an excused absence. But if it is an uncle, it is not an excused absence. Um, so as a team, you've got to overcome maybe what your organization says as excused and you have to talk through that. Do you have someone on your team that is dealing with an aging parent? Well, then if they've got a problem and they've got to miss a meeting, you, you've already established that, right? That's a norm. So you're okay with that. But again, you're having those transparent conversations. Assignments. When assignments are made, what should be done? If a team member doesn't complete them, or conversely, what happens when a small bit of your project is completed and it is awesome? It is rock star quality. Well, maybe you need to have a norm that actually celebrates that. When I was at Oklahoma State, I loved this. Um, they were trying, the, the leadership team was trying to develop a team norm and a team culture of celebrating, um, sorry, first world problems with my Roomba. <laughs> you can't make this up, kids. Okay, um, but they were trying to develop a team culture and norm for... <laughs> I'm going to get through this slide. <laughs> Uh, for uh, research and for getting journal articles accepted. And so what they would do, they had this hideous orange Christmas tree that looked like a Car Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And every time you got something published in a journal, they would write your name and the journal name on a little black, because Oklahoma State's colors were orange and black, on a little black uh, tree ornament and you got to hang the ornament on the tree and then you got to put the tree in your office until the next person 
got something uh, published. And I thought that was such a cool tradition to start, right? And it celebrated the good, not just punished the bad. And participation, what should be done to encourage everyone to participate? I was in a classroom one time that had a chronic oversharer and the professor, this I thought this was genius, they brought out a poker set and they gave us each two poker chips per class. And when you had a thought, when you contributed to the discussion, you threw your poker chip into the middle of the room. When you're out of poker chips, you're out of thoughts. And what that made those people, again, who chronically talk a lot, what that made them do was say, is this worth a poker chip? And if it is, I'm gonna spend my poker chip. But if it's not, if it's just a random fleeting idea, then I'm gonna save that poker chip. But the professor could look around and see who had their poker chips left, and then he would specifically ask that person, hey, we haven't heard from you today. Throw in your poker chip, let's talk. And I thought that was such a cool way to normalize the idea that everyone needs to share. Now, let's talk about culture. And again, I'm gonna be as brief as I possibly can. As someone who teaches a whole class on this, it's really hard. Okay, so what is team culture? So it is not only your team norms, but it is those shared values, beliefs, your member roles, the patterns of interaction. It is guided by, but not necessarily defined by organizational culture. So what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is that your culture needs to be supportive of teams from an organizational point of view, but there, if there are some organizational things that don't match with your specific team, your team can choose not to engage in that in some instances. I think when of a high school, um, so I, I just told you my dad was an ag teacher. So if you had ag in your program in high school, and you may have had similar experiences with different types of of teachers, um, when it came to dress code, you know, the organizational culture was professional dress for teachers in high school. And that meant different things to different units. The English teachers were always dressed in, you know, nice skirts or nice dress pants, you know, a blouse. If it was a male teacher, he always had a button up or a nice polo on. Um, the math teachers looked a little different. They weren't as formal as the Engl English teachers, but you know, they weren't wearing yoga pants and stuff, uh, but they were more business casual. But then you had like the technology and ag guys, right? And they're wearing Wranglers. And you know, if it was a nice day, they'd wear a button up. Um, but it, you know, they'd probably throw on a polo with their jeans and their boots. And that's what their normalized organizational team culture was, which was different than the organizational culture of the whole high school. So sometimes that happens within teams. Um, the organization may have a specific stance and then your team has a little bit more flexibility to express themselves in a way they would. And I want you to think about this, the word culture is so loaded now, even within the last decade, right? It has changed what we think of culture and, and the impact that that has. And we think of things like cancel culture and we think, you know, think of different types of cultures and that makes an impact, right? As we go forward. And sometimes we have those clashes of culture and those clashes of culture could be within your team versus the organization. It could be clashes of culture within your own team. Um, it could be those personalized classes of culture. I think about a lot when, um, when my kids used to be sick, you know, when we were in the season of life in daycare where they had to be fever free for 24 hours. And you guys that have tiny humans, you know, you know, they could get a little bug and they're fine, you know, in three hours or run around like crazy women, but you know, daycare won't take them. And so what do you do? So as a professor, I cannot tell you how many times I taught with a toddler on my hip or a toddler running around <laughs> terrorizing my classroom or or whatever that was you know he or she both Brenna and Cooper um were you know not sick enough to stay home for me to have to cancel class but they were too sick according to daycare to go back to daycare and so that was a culture clash because my professor culture was telling me you don't cancel class 
But my mommy culture was telling me, you take care of your kiddo. And so when that happens, um, that can happen within a team and it can happen with team versus that kind of big organizational culture. Quickly, I'm going to run through this. If you haven't seen Edgar Schein's work on culture, he is like the guy. He has organizational culture down to a, huh, a science. Um, I met him once at the International Leadership Association Conference and totally fangirl geeked out. I like went up to him, I'm like, Dr. Schein, you know, your work is amazing. And he, I mean, just, I think at this point he's an octogenarian, right? And he looked at me and he grabbed my hand and he goes, oh, sweetheart. He said, number one, I'm not Dr. Schein. He said, I'm just Ed. Just call me Ed. I'm like, oh my God, he told me to call him Ed. Okay, so let's talk about Ed Schein. So he says that there are three levels of culture. So the kind of top level um, are the things that we can see, but may be hard to decipher. Now, what does that mean? So our artifacts are this idea that it's the phenomenon that someone coming into the organization or someone coming into your team can see, hear, feel when you encounter this new group. So you can observe it with your five senses, but you don't exactly know what it means right? You don't know the why behind it. You just see the what. Again, Texas A&M is just ripe for this. We do a lot of things, again, that are kind of crazy. Like if you were a parent, and this happened to me, um, I had a parent come and sit, in, who was not an Aggie, come sit in one of my undergrad classes where Reveille was a member of my class. And she got spooked by something and she started barking. And so what did I do as a good Ag? I let class out and this parent came up to me and said, what just happened? That's nuts. And I said, well, according to A&M tradition, if Reveille barks in class, then class is over. And he just could not wrap his mind around that. He was like, you guys are a cult. I'm like, well, sometimes, yeah, pr pretty much. And so it's that idea of, of things that people maybe don't understand. Um, going back to OSU, you know, the leadership work group at that time did some really cool things. And one of the things when I was a brand new graduate student, they said, hey, we're having our leadership work group meeting at Whitehall, which was the um, actual education building there at Oklahoma State. And he said, it's Friday at three, um, make sure you come. And I was like, okay, you bet, I'll be there. And I was so excited to be included, right? So I went to Whitehall and sat there, and sat there, cause you know me, I'm early, and sat there and sat there, did not have anybody. So finally my phone rings and it was my committee chair. And she said, where are you? And I said, I'm sitting over here at Whitehall. I'm, with, I'm in the lobby. I didn't see any of you guys come in. Like, where are we meeting? You guys didn't give me a room number. And then all of a sudden I hear this raucous laughter and I'm thinking, oh, they're hazing me. Like, this is bad. And they said, oh, we forgot to tell you the code. Whitehall is actually, it was one of the local Mexican restaurants in town. Um, and they're like, we don't actually meet on campus. We come and have margaritas. We get a lot done that way. And I'm like, oh my gosh, right? I had no idea from the outside. I had no clue. But for them, that was just part of what they do. Now values, and sometimes you'll see this as espoused beliefs and values. This is really thinking about that idea that, that group learning or team learning ultimately reflects someone's original belief, right? And how do we grow from that? So that leader that established the organization or the person who established the team or those primacy parts of um, group norms, espouse beliefs and values are what we tell people we believe. At Texas A&M, what are our spouse beliefs and values? Well, we have our core values. We have relis. We can talk about relis. We can talk about respect and and loyalty and leadership and service and all of those different parts of relis are our espoused values. Now it should go back to, okay, this is what we value, this is what we believe. This is how we act, right? So when you're thinking about creating your culture, you have to actually have a discussion in this forming stage of what do we value? What do we believe? How are we gonna let people know that? Are we gonna put it on a t-shirt? Are we gonna write it down? How are we gonna do these things? And looking at this, shared values become embodied into the ideological philosophy, basically, of the team. Um, and it's a good way to help you when things turn sideways, 
right? When things go bad, when there's a crisis, when you've got a problem, you go back to those values. You go back to that kind of core identity of who you are. And then underlying assumptions are those unconscious assumptions that distort data sometimes. Um, once was a hypothesis became reality and then no one has actually asked why do we do that or why do we believe that or why are the thing why do we continue to do that so to go back to my reveille example um that was actually a, a good reveille she only barked like i think once that semester when i was a master's student um and I was uh, working on, actually back then they gave master students their own classes to teach. I don't know what, why they did, but they did. And so I was teaching a class and I had a crazy reveille. If you haven't been around Texas A&M long, um, we have had a couple that are beautiful. And the reason why they're beautiful is because you know they're inbred and that makes them crazy. And she actually had to wear a band around her mouth because she would like bite tiny humans and referees. It became a problem. So this crazy rev was in my class and she would bark all the time. If I moved too fast, if I spoke too loud, um, if I'm using my hands and y'all can't see me, but I'm in front of a computer by myself in my dining room and I'm still using my hands to talk. And so she would bark all the time. So like the third time she barked, I was like, y'all, we got to get through this. Like we can't just not have class. The fourth time she barked, I'm pretty sure the handler did it on purpose because it's in the middle of the test. And I said, hey, no problem. I'll just take your grade, whatever you've done so far. Oh, and then they changed their mind. They didn't want to leave the, the test at that point. The fifth time I said, no, no, we're not doing this. This rev's crazy. We're not going to do this anymore. And they reported me, no lie, to the Traditions Council because I was breaking tradition. And so when I talked to the advisor of the Traditions Council, um, it was Rusty Thompson at the time, and I said, Rusty, like, I understand that this is a tradition at Texas A&M. This rev, it doesn't make any sense because she's nuts. Why, do we, why are we making these assumptions that this is what we should continue to do? Why can't we change things? And so it was a really great conversation. I mean, obviously the tradition still stands, um, but we have better revelies. And so it's that idea that no one ever really takes the time to say, why have we always done it this way? You know, why do we always have meetings at Friday on Fridays at 3.30? Well, it's fine if you're at a Mexican restaurant and enjoying a margarita. It's not fine if you're stuck in the middle of your office, right? And you just want to go home. So it's really interesting that we just don't kind of work through those things. So how do we create team culture? So if we're talking about these norms, how do, how do we order some strategies to create or kind of perpetuate that culture? One is thinking about the ceremonies. You know, so that idea of the Christmas tree to going from office to office for the person who, um, who got that article published and writing your name on the ornament. I remember when I got my first article published as a PhD student, I was proud, yes, but it was almost just as cool to put my name on the ornament and to know probably somewhere in Ag Hall in Stillwater, Oklahoma, there is a tree with some, with some ornaments on it. Um, and it was a very ceremonial. You did it um, at a faculty meeting. It was a big deal. We perpetuate life through stories. Um, as you can tell, I am a storyteller by heart. That's how I communicate. It's how I teach. Um, but there's a reason why Jesus chose parables, right? To try to teach us things. It's because stories are easy for us to understand and easy for us to remember. And so it's that idea of how do you create this culture is by telling the stories, the good stories, the bad stories, the in-between stories, but that helps create and perpetuate culture. Looking at symbols, so what are those artifacts? What artifacts do you want to have for your team? Um, do you all love The Office, the TV show, right? Well, then you can have fun memes that you send back and forth. That could be a, a symbol. That could also be specialized language. If somebody's complaining a lot, you can turn to them and tell them they're being Angela. Or if someone is a know-it-all, you can accuse them of being Oscar, whatever that is. You know, utilizing that to create that culture. And socialization, encouraging that idea of bonding. And because as we know, with team development, you have to work on the task as well as the relationship. 
So quickly, I want to hit this, and this is a very brief overview of Hofstede. So if you are a leadership scholar, you know who Hofstede is. So his role in the GLOBE study, um, which again, look at the date, right? It totally needs to be redone. Um, it, be, it was the beginning of looking at leadership on an international scale, that every region looks at leadership differently. So we need to kind of take Hofstede's, I would say, conceptual framework and take a step backwards and say, how does that actualize within a team? So he has many more categories than the four that I have listed here. But I think for a team, these are the most important. So when we look at this, when we think about individualism versus collectivism, in a someone that believes in an individualist culture, um, they have loose social ties and it's really all about me and all about mine. So those that are individual, it's what it, what's in it for me, honestly, just call a spade a spade. What's in it for me? How will this help me? How will this benefit me? How will this benefit my, my tribe? Now, if your team is your tribe, that's great. If not, that could be problematic. I have no idea what just happened. Okay, collectivism is kind of the, again, opposite of that. Collectivist value they value compliance, but they, they really value harmony more than anything. What is the greater good? So from an ethical standpoint, individualism is more egoist based. Uh, collectivism is more utilitarian based, right? What is the good for all? How can I do the most good for those involved? And we know that just as individuals, it doesn't matter regionally. Regionally may have some, well, Hofstede has proved it has some impact on that. But we know collectively within our working teams um, that there are some people that are absolutely out for number one and will put their needs above everyone else's day in, day out. And we also have, we know that there are people that will are bleeding hearts and will do everything for someone else and never think about putting their mask on first in the airplane, right? And so you have to understand how is that going to impact your culture and how could that, again, possibly lead to storming as we move forward. Power. I love this one. We're going to talk about power when we talk about cooperation. So in, in low power cultures or people that ascribe to low power, they are less willing to accept the authority to others based on positional power. If it is a, so basically that one is, do you believe that a person has power based on their title or based on their work? So personal power bases versus professional power bases. Um, personal power bases are respect, their um, information, their expert, their things that an individual has and controls with or without a title. There are some people that will not listen to other people unless they do have a title and they wield that reward or coercion power. So looking at what power structure actually influences you is really important as a team. Uncertainty. Um, how willing are you to accept uncertainty? <laughs> like, I don't know how this is going to work, but, uh, but I'll try it. Are you that person? right? Um, and risk is similarly attached, but a little bit different. Um, you know, you have some people that are, are absolutely risk averse. I will raise my hand on that one. I'm very risk adverse. Um, my retirement is through Texas teacher retirement. Why? Well, number one, that's what my parents had. Um, and they had retired by the time I came back to A&M and I saw that, hey, working for a pension is not that bad, right? They're, they're comfortable. Are they, you know, do they have a beach house? No, um, but they're comfortable. They can make ends meet, you know, versus those that are willing to accept risk. They're like, why would I be on a pension plan? I'm putting all my money in the stock market and I'm going to buy a yacht and uh, I'm going to live on the beach. <laughs> and so, and that works for them. Um, so when it comes to, you know, that, Risk is kind of a, you can kind of laugh at it a little bit, but some of us are known risk takers. Um, your entrepreneurial spirit, you're willing to put yourself out there and, and do something. And there are some of us that are absolutely not that way. I'm not going to try something unless I know I'm going to be pretty good at it to begin with. Um, I've got a ukulele hanging out in my office that uh, it's been there for about a year and I was going to learn how to play, but I don't know if I'll be good at it or not. So it's still sitting there because that's kind of a risk, kind of risky.
you know, okay, I know that's a silly example, but you know where I'm going with that. So when you have these kind of dichotomous views of acceptable behavior, right, norms and culture, how are you going to work through those as a team? How are you going to be better? Woo! So a whole semester worth of culture in like 30 minutes. You're like, that was longer than 30 minutes. Okay, um, so we have talked about the impact of culture and norms. So when you think about what your team development portfolio is going to look like, your plan, what are those norms that you think are important? Go back to that list. Things that you believe that a team needs to kind of hash out. Do you want to have a team contract? Do you want to incorporate certain amounts of the organizational culture into the team culture? What will that look like for you? So examples of what are some ceremonies you can use? How can you incorporate storytelling? So as you are preparing that team development plan, think through that of not only here's the literature I'm going to say to support it, but here are the actual action items I want to do. Okay, until next time.